Good afternoon, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us anywhere in the world. Um, thank you for coming today um, to be a part of our short um, webinar um, titled Ilojoba Five Years After. Um, this webinar is just a sneak peek at all the work that um, FEMK and let's have, um, for us also have conversations around heritage and change our perspectives. We're delighted to have everyone here today. And just so that you know, this webinar is organized by Legacy. And as a form of introduction, we have the current president of Legacy, Mrs. Kofo Adeliki. She'll be giving us a very brief introduction about Legacy and our but before we get to that, I would just like to lay down a few ground rules. Because of the volume of people that we have here and with most um, Zoom meetings, it's important that we have some form of organization. So any questions, please put them in the chat box and at the end of the program, we'll answer all the questions as much time that we have. Then we'll also appreciate that everyone while you're having conversations within the chat box, please do so respectfully and we're trying to keep to time. So we'll advise all those that will be speaking. And if you are called upon to make a comment, please be conscious of everybody in the room and let's keep to time. Um, if, it's, if one of our speakers or it's taking a while, I will try to interject so that we are all conscious of that. And like you are all aware, I need to just let you know that this webinar is being recorded. Okay, now, thank you very much, everyone. Please let's make welcome Mrs. Adeliki as she introduces Legacy. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Keiju. Um, well, welcome everybody. Um, it's great to have people here from all around the world, which is really fantastic. My name, as uh, Keiju has said, is Kofi Adeleke, and I'm the current president of Legacy. Legacy is the historical and environmental interest group of Nigeria. And for the past 12 months, we've been celebrating our 25th anniversary, although we did actually start before then. We are probably about 30 years old, but officially uh, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary. And this webinar is actually um, part of a series of webinars to actually uh, mark that. Um, Legacy um, is run by voluntary effort to promote and preserve historic buildings and monuments in Nigeria. We, um, we, we, we do tours, exhibitions, uh, lots of research activities, workshops, publications, educational activities, especially for children. We have thousands of school children who visit Jekyll House, which is a building within the railway compound in Abutimeta, which uh, Legacy actually restored. Um, so to, to actually sort of say a little bit about this particular um, webinar, Iloja Bar, five years later, communicating heritage to the public. Um, I would say that the 11th of September has turned out to be quite an inauspicious date because I know that a lot of you know that today is also the date that we're commemorating 20 years of the, um, the, the uh, fall of the, the Twin Towers. Um, but, you know, um, but it was really devastating five years ago when Lodja Bar um, was um, brutally demolished. Um, uh, this is a, a, a building that is a national monument, a listed building. It was dreadful. And Legacy had for a long time been involved in, um, you know, trying to create awareness about Lodja Bar. And in fact, um, in, in, with its restorations, I mean, we were involved in doing measured drawings of the building. The building was in a very poor state, but we were actually trying to work with the family and the, the National Commission for Monuments and Museums in Nigeria to preserve it. Um, so Legacy has actually been involved in, in Ilojaba for quite some time. And I think it was in 2018, we had a workshop called Heritage management which way forward and so this webinar is also sort of another step in that direction another follow-on that was sponsored by the Goethe Institute and we had four days or I think two days in May 2018 and two days in September where we um, looked at heritage management and it was it we actually put these on because it was actually a reaction to what had happened with Lodja Bar so I'm really happy happy that we are still continuing to have um, these discussions. Um, and also, um, Legacy has been involved in the technical committee 
which was set up after the de demolition um, to sort out a memorandum of um, understanding, which was signed early this year. And I'm really pleased to say that the new building, when it eventually goes up, will actually have space, an exhibition space for um, Brazilian uh, culture and heritage, and also a space to tell the full story of Iloja Bar. Now, this event is um, a very interesting continuation of all of these efforts to raise awareness about how we can protect built heritage. Um, apart from heritage specialists from Nigeria, we also have um, them from abroad. And also, um, Femcare Van Ziel will be presenting findings from her original research on Elodja Bar. Um, and she has uncovered some very fascinating information. So I think we are really going to enjoy this webinar. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mrs. Adeleke. Um, that's an interesting introduction. Like she has, like she said, today we're remembering the Ilojaba that was demolished this time five years ago. And for that, um, Femke has prepared a short video, which we'll be showing right now.
Wow. Thank you very much, Femke. Um, I think that video was just reminiscent. You can see how the environment from the early days and how the environment around the building was changing till its unfortunate um, demolition. And what it currently is, is just a site. Yes, can you hear me now? Some people are saying they can't hear me. Okay. I can hear you saying before, thanks. I can hear you now. Okay. All we right. can. Thank you. So um, very quickly, I'll be introducing some of our panelists today and I'll just have a brief um, interview with them. I'll start with um, Professor Cordelia Os Os Osashona. She's, uh, she's, I'm sorry, I mispronounced it, Osashona, Professor Cordelia Osashona. She teaches history of architecture and she's the first and only person to have taught the heritage management at the University of Ileife. Her approach teaching this course was very, very hands on. Um, Professor Sashino, could you please describe how you and your students will go into the field to fix up houses and try to persuade the owners to follow suit? Thank you very much. Like you rightly said, my um, adventure, let me put it this way, my adventure into heritage matters actually was foisted. You know, the opportunity to get involved was something that was foisted on me. Part of the new curriculum that came on board in the mid 1990s had architectural conservation and restoration as a core course in the master's program. And that was seeded to me. So I had to source, you know, materials to teach. I had to more or less, you know, flesh up the program. So I introduced this field module. And I worked, you know, in collaboration with two other academics. One was a lecturer in the department and the other person was actually the natural history and museums. So the way we structured what we did on the field, the person who was a colleague in the department had his first area, primary area of competency in land surveying. And then the person from um, the History Museum was, but well, more important, he was, or he is an Ife indigenous. So going out among the people, I knew it was extremely important for us to have a son of the soil as part of the team, you know, who would help us make the requisite overtures, speak, you know, the local lingo and, you know, disarm the people so that they would understand we were coming in good faith. There was nothing to be feared by whatever it is we wanted to do. So what I discovered basically then was that, honestly, there's such, there's so much, so many beautiful samples of Brazilian auto, Brazilian, other vernacular types of building out there in town, crying for attention, crying for a new lease of life. And there was just no way we could do anything really meaningful. So what we set ourselves as a target was just to, after getting, you know, wooing the house owners, getting their support, getting their confidence, we would now intervene minimally, usually on the front facade mend cracks, you know, get rid of uh, like another, you know, types of soiling, and then paint just that front facade. And the idea was that once the owners saw the new lease of life, they would be energized, galvanized, you know, to go an extra mile, in fact, to go the whole home yeah. and do the rest. But unfortunately, that was never our experience. And in wow. terms of the actual wherewithal, you know, financial wherewithal, the students paid a token each, but we three lecturers levied ourselves to buy the paint, to hire you know, the, the artisans who did whatever needed doing. And that was how we operated. And personally, it was, very, was not particularly fulfilling to me because they, they never beat the bait. The owners never just caught on to do anything beyond whatever it, it was we did. But that was, you know, when I could teach that course. After a while, it was crapped. Later, it came up and it became an elective. And I was getting just mm -hmm. one, two students. So that 
field practice was totally knocked off. But in the last five years, interestingly enough, private individuals have been coming to me who felt, you know, sentimental about the family property and who wanted to give it a new lease of life. So that's where I really come into my own to do the little, like you rightly said, hands-on things, you know, nothing really very theoretical, very scientific, just with my professional training as an architect and my passion to see these heritage structures not perish. So I've been doing quite a lot. I've done three in the last, um, since 2016, I've done three. And I found it very, very fulfilling. I think that's quite remarkable. And I um, attest to how it's so important to have the, the owners of the building participate in this process of um, um, preservation or restoration as um, you may call it. And I, it's so quite unfortunate that it's something that is now just left as an elective in our um, school mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. first learning the architectural mm -hmm. profession. Um, thank mm -hmm. you so much, um, Professor Osashuno. And I'll now go on to speak with, thank you for these images. These are some of the work that you have done. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. And now I'll go on and speak with um, Dr. Ugwai. Yes, Dr. Ugwai studied archaeology and tourism, but he has a focus on heritage. I think reading his CV was just an interesting mix because I would never have um, really associated heritage with some um, archaeology. Now, Dr. Ugwai, explain how your childhood in your village in the East eventually sparked your interest in heritage? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Pedro. I think uh, if I'm right, if I pronounce yes, that appropriately. Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. Thank you for getting me on board and uh, thank you, Femke, for uh, making this possible. First of all, I, I will uh, start with my experience in the village. Um, Sometimes in early uh, 90s, when I was growing up in the village, not urban area, not when I say village is more than rural, and uh, so that you understand it. Yeah, so <laughs> uh, my experience is, uh, was anchored on uh, the village setting, which uh, was uh, organized within a cultural landscape called Otobo, uh, the village square. I prefer to call it village arena anyway. So, and uh, yeah, all my life, uh, we, we look up to activities in the village square and how uh, that controls activities in the entire village setting. And, uh, you know, uh, this idea of uh, mask festivals, this idea of other festivals and this idea of, you know, uh, moonlight plays and all that. So. And we, I, I had this experience. So uh, moving to study at higher institution, well, I, I planned to study economics. And wow. the, the jump, uh, the jump uh, intricacies made me uh, change mind. It wasn't totally my uh, decision. I think uh, some persons uh, spoke to me about a diploma program in the Department of Archaeology, uh, which was a tourism and museum studies. And I was like, Museum, tourism, what is it? So uh, when I explored, uh, the first thing that drew my attention was tourism. And uh, to me then, it was just about movement. So I was like, oh, I'll have opportunity to move around the world and experience and explore. So, and I said, okay, that would be fine. So I moved into the uh, diploma program. And I think two weeks into it, I got exposed uh, through an anthropological course we borrowed. And uh, I think it was the first strike for me was that of a uh, narrative about uh, uh, Malinowski, who, who is the father of uh, what they call a functionalism. So uh, that's not for this conversation. That's not for this audience. So, but well, I love the idea that he lived in a community and experienced the people's life and was able to document it. So, that drew my attention to, okay, I think this might be another kind of experience, going into villages and documenting people and studying them. So I picked interest, finished diploma program, did my first degree and did my master's and decided to do my PhD in, uh, on heritage studies and focusing on that, my Igbo village square, which was my own kind of, uh, the, when, when you hear, uh, 
Yes, ex exactly. So now uh, that's, that's exactly what brought me thus far. And uh, I think uh, those experiences are very important in my uh, thinking about heritage at the moment, because uh, I now begin to look back into my experience and link it up with my other identities, being a Christian, traveling to study for a PhD in the UK, where uh, heritage is something else. And in my village, heritage is another thing. So, and these combinations, I mean, uh, changed my thinking about heritage. And I, I started looking at it from what is now called a critical heritage studies. So I think uh, that's for your question, yeah. Now, so um, I think, thank you. I find it very interesting how you said that um, tourism attracted you and you thought about traveling all around the world. And how yeah. would you say that um, our heritage, if it's thought in its um, traditional form, because it's always viewed as something that is static and not something that um, can change or not something that can evolve or move. Um, can you explain to this audience here how a tree in the village square and a medicine called, I'm not sure if I pronounce it right, Odiokara, thank you so much, <laughs> eventually changed your concept of um, heritage? Yes. Um... Yeah, I think uh, I, I came across this particular one uh, during my PhD study in a village called uh, Umuobira in Mburugu. Okay. It's in Enbu State, Southeast Nigeria, where in a particular village square, there, there was this tree. Uh, when I went there, it was dead already, decomposing. But uh, interestingly, that, that tree was carrying a narrative of Odiokara. Uh, let me just give a background to uh, the concept of Odiokara. Odiokara to them uh, was a charm or a medicine made, for, made by uh, someone they invited to help them identify the names of some of their visitors who wished to live with them if they, are, were, they were able to identify their names. There were four. And interestingly, this narrative created how the Igbo uh, calendar, the four days Igbo calendar were uh, 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 originated. Uh, within the, the, the meat. So uh, when the Dibia, that's the medicine man came and made Odiokara, uh, actually uh, he, he turned the Odiokara to a rat and uh, the rat was exploring the bags of those visitors. And uh, uh, you know, the bags in this context, locally it is called Abuba. So it's not just usual bag, it's a calabash, a kind of calabash designed in the ancient time that they travel with, with their properties. So, okay. and this particular rat entered one of the bags and made noise. And one of the uh, uh, women called the owner of that particular bag by name AK. And by mentioning that AK, the people now got the, the name of one of the visitors. So the rat moved around into their bags and they were able to call their names. And this was how the people identified their names. Interestingly, AK is the first day in Igbo calendar, followed by Uri, Afo, and Unkwo. So these are the four Igbo calendars in the Igbo mythology. Uh, so now, after that experience, Odiokara was monumentalized in the tree, uh, silk cotton. And that silk cotton, well, that was what I made that was already dead and decomposed. So I'm not sure if maybe another tree was bearing the narrative of Odiokara before the silk uh, cotton tree. But when I arrived, the sick cotton tree was already dead. And uh, the next tree, which took over from that sick cotton, also continued to bear the narrative of Odiokara without necessarily uh, the people thinking that anything has changed. So, and that takes me to the idea of authenticity of heritage. So for, for people around this part of the world, it is the narrative that matters and not necessarily the materiality. So I know I will be having problem here with uh, uh, art historians and architectural uh, scholars, but I think we have to engage this and uh, this is an opportunity to do that. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ogwai. And I think um, you yeah, are touching on something that is very um, important because there's tangible and intangible heritage. And in my personal opinion, I feel that, like you have said, it is the stories that actually give meaning to what we consider as being um, tangible. Um, very quickly, and so that our time is in two spent, um, I will now invite Mrs. Rukaya Tofa Bashir. Mrs. Rukaya Tofa Bashir was the founder of 
the Kano chapter of the International Network for Traditional Building, Architecture and Urbanism, short form in Bao. Mrs. Tofa Bashir, you initially worked for a modern architectural firm. What is it that shifted your attention to the preservation of traditional house architecture? Thank you so much for joining us today. Hello, um, thank you for having me. Um, what shifted my, I think what shifted my um, kind of route into architecture, I worked mostly at a, as a part one student um, as, a, um, as an architectural assistant in the UK. I worked with three firms before deciding on my next step. And um, I think what really um, made me delve into what I really wanted, what route of architecture I wanted to follow was that I wasn't really enjoying it. There was nothing um, that was really kind of inspiring me to have this as a long-term or as a vocational um, you know, route. So I, I really had to think deeply and um, what really inspired, what, what really grabbed my attention was how much I enjoyed my hist my um, final history essay for my third year <laughs> during wow. my degree. And it was all about basically what, um, what inspired you. So my essay was mostly about my going to my village of, um, actually my surname is my um, village's name, Tofa. And um, so we used to go there as kids during Eid, the Muslim um, festival. And um, I remember, you know, it was really a time for celebration. It was a time that you got to meet, like all the cousins would end up there. So I had a lot of good memories and um, images that I had carried on, you know, of these long winding um, earth walls always remained with me. They always gave me a sense of happiness and a sense of place in a way. Um, so my whole essay was about that architecture, um, that particular building, my ancestry um, place. Um, so I think when I was stuck in, in, in a sense of where to go in terms of my career, that really kept on coming up. And I knew that I had to find um, something architecture that is a bit more sensitive, not just sensible, not just about design, um, but something that was meaningful and something that really connected me with, um, with the design. And I figured that um, it was probably in terms, so I found out that it was really to do with sustainability. And so that's the route that I took. And I went on later on after my part two to go into um, architecture, energy and sustainability. And then I worked with um, Intbao. I actually started working as a volunteer at the Princess Foundation because I found that they were doing a lot of community architecture and they, they were doing a lot of projects where um, sustainability was at the heart of it all. Um, so I wanted to gain experience. Um, and then through that, I found out that the Intbao offices actually were within the foundation. And so I started working with Intbao and um, we put up the, our first conference, which was um, uh, the relevance of traditional architecture in housing the urban poor. And so that was the conference that really made me um, consider coming back to Nigeria and wow. setting up the Intbao chapter. And we did very well. We had a lot of members, uh, most of the university. That's where I met um, Professor <laughs> Osasona. And okay. um, a lot of professors that were interested in heritage and conservation or sustainability. Wow. That's really interesting that you've mentioned um, tying heritage with sustainability because I think um, when those buildings were created, there was no other choice. They had to be sustainable. It, exactly. Know what that word meant. Um, yes. I know that you were recently involved in the renovation of an old school in yes. Tambora, Tamborawa. Can you explain yes. how you integrated um, traditional architecture and modern ideas about sustainability within the school? Yes. So, um, 
I got involved with this project, um, I was I found myself back in Kano, um, and I had started my business there. And there was a, an NGO called Free that got in touch with me, and uh, they needed somebody to help them with the renovation of this school. And so it was very clear for me from the beginning that this was what I wanted to do, um, that I wanted to conserve it, but at the same time, bring in some modern ideas as well. So um, we, we did this building and I already working with Intbao and um, I already had worked with some of the builders here because we used to do workshops um, in teaching architectural students and professionals in traditional house architecture or um, clay block, building with clay blocks, you know, those type of um, subjects. So um, I already knew some of the builders here and we decided to do something um, in that manner. So yeah, I was I very like pleased with it. I think the project was an opportunity to practice all that you had to been practice teaching. what I've been writing about and talking about all this while. Now, um, I must say that we did have problems because, you know, this was my first actual project of building. Everything I've done um, was really on paper. And so there were there were obstacles, mainly with the roof, because um, unfortunately, um, during the construction, I had to travel for a bit and um, the supervisor there, by the time they got to the roof level, they had not interpreted the drawings as they should have. And so instead of this um, roofing that you see in the drawing, it became more of a flat roof. Now, as architects, we know how <laughs> flat roofs can be very, very troublesome. Um, so we, we did have leakage um, issues with the roof, but um, that's that sorted out. Okay. Um, yeah, it was very important to go with that because one, um, the, uh, it, it, like I said, it's a school that is run by an NGO. So mostly we try to limit the, um, the energy, um, energy, the energy the exactly down. on the building. So we wanted to save on, you know, electricity and also wanted it to be as cool as it can be. And we wanted to have at the same time enough sunlight. Um, so we were able to achieve those. That's a beautiful example. Thank you so much. Um, I'll move on to our next panelist. I hope everybody is still pretty engaged. There's still going to be a panel discussion, but very quickly, let me introduce Heritage Architects all the way from Brazil. Heritage Architects Carla Rabelo Costa of the National Historic and Artistic Heritage Institute of Brazil, IPHAN, is in charge of management of heritage, which includes communication with and involvement of the public. Um, she will give a short presentation of a heritage project in Salvador. Salvador is the Brazilian region where many of the returnees who came to Lagos in the 19th century returned from. Hello, thank you for having me. Yeah, I, I, I brought the, the, this case of Salvador because I think it, it resembles with the Lodge of Bar, I think uh, time-wise in history also. Um, and when Fanky showed me Lodge of Bar for the first time, I really thought I was in Salvador. It was like a picture from Salvador. So when uh, we were talking about which example should I bring to this webinar, I thought immediately that I should bring like Salvador. Um, so Salvador is a, a heritage and also a world heritage um, site since from 1985. So uh, you can pass, thank you. You can pass until the, the letters. So of course, it's one of our, uh, we have like the biggest black community in Brazil, in Salvador. Um, and we got this portion, you can stay there. Um, this is the, like a portion of the city that is, uh, uh, listed as a national monument site and also the, um, as a world heritage site. So uh, Salvador is a really big city with over 2 million people, but this portion is, um, is a portion of the site that uh, has like a lower level and an upper level town. You can pass, um, thank you. 
And I brought this example because since uh, the, um, the webinar uh, title is um, Communicating Heritage, we are at the IFAN, uh, the Heritage Institute in Brazil. We are trying to um, get uh, all the stakeholders together to try to get the best out, out of the preservations because this top-down thing that we've been doing as an institution was not working very well. So uh, Salvador itself um, uh, has a lot of uh, moments, historical moments and political moments. But nowadays, since 2017, we are working um, alongside with the municipality and with the state and with several institutions, universities as well, and trying to work with the community to try to explain what the values of the site is. So you can see now what are the values where the, uh, Salvador was recognized from. So um, if the community doesn't acknowledge uh, why it's important to preserve, so it's, it's difficult for them to get on board and try to help us uh, to um, preserve the site from the other generations. So it's it's a long process. It's a daunting process of the coming and going. You, you can go for, um, thank you. And, um, you can see from this um, that, that Salvador has a very low level of education and income. Um, it has a lot of diversity of people also. On the little bottom um, picture, you can see the lower um, town and the uptown. So we have a lot of difference in architecture, uh, a lot of styles, different styles. You can go on, thank you. Next one, please. And uh, since the 1980s, they have like several trials to try to preserve um, those those buildings that are, were not like in a good shape. Um, sometimes uh, on the 80s, uh, in a top top down approach, uh, but nowadays we are trying to get on this uh, new approach of getting together uh, on this stakeholder and getting everybody engaged to see if we, if we can sustain the preservation for longer. Um, you can go on, thank you. And now you can see one of the most iconic views from the Pelourinho, uh, where we have like several uh, intangible heritage also, because I think built a heritage also comes with the intangible heritage itself. So it's a very lively city. And of course, if, if you can see from the architectural point of view, you can see a lot of resemb resemblance uh, with a Lojo bar. Um, so uh, I would say uh, that Lojo bar, like time-wise, like uh, Fenke wrote on her, her thesis, uh, it has this eclectic uh, resemblance with the, the majority of uh, architectural buildings in Salvador. You can, yeah. That's a view from the sea, and you can see the, all the levels of, of the city. And thank you so much. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that presentation. That's so beautiful. Um, and I quite agree. We've had um, at Legacy somebody visit from Brazil, and she did um, comment that some of the buildings that we have reminded her of her grandmother's house, and the pictures really do show the similarity. Thank you so much for joining us today. And now we are going to, we haven't got into the climax, but we are going to have a presentation by Femke that shows all her findings on Ilojoba. Femke, over to you. Thank you so much. Is my sound on? Yes. We can, can you hear me? All right. Yes. Um, well, all my findings, that will be a bit much uh, in the, uh, about 15 minutes that I'm going to take, but I'm going to give you a bit of an overview. But first of all, I'm so happy to see all of you here from all over the world, but also from all over Nigeria. There's a reason there are people here from the east and from the south and from the north, uh, and that there are people who are involved in uh, legacy, in, in heritage management from all those places, because um, I... I've been hearing Nigerians don't care about heritage and I've almost started believing it, but I'm meeting so many people 
who do care, but the question is just, do we tell them the right, do we tell the public the right stories? Are we using the right narrative? And uh, there's no better example I've come to uh, realize than Ilojo Bar or Olaya House, as it would be to the Olaya family. It's also a family house. Or Casa do Fernandes, as it was in the early days of his existence. And um, I want to tell you a little bit about what I've learned about that history, the making of the monument, but also the history of the, the house itself, and what that might say about how we have approached heritage and what we might learn about it. Now, this is, of course, the tragic end of uh, the house itself, of the national monument we knew as Ilojo Bar. But the question is, how did we get there? And um, I've heard often the family being uh, pointed out as the main culprits, but over my, the course of my, um, my, uh, my research, I've realized that, well, nobody has ever took uh, anybody along on that voyage of why is this, why do we think this is an important building? And I will show you how that came. Now, what do we really know about Ilojo Bar? We know that it was on Lagos Island in Lagos, Nigeria. We know that it was a national monument since 1956. And we know that it was demolished on September 11, 2016. We also know that it was bought uh, from a distance by Alfred Ola, Omola, or, or, sorry, Alfred Omolana Olaya in 1933. Um, at the time, he was not a known man in Lagos and the family tradition says that the rich Brazilians in the room were saying, were looking at each other because he bought it at an auction, um, that, that they were saying, who is this Olaya person and how come he has so much money? So uh, that we also know, but otherwise there are a lot of dis discrepancies in the story. We don't know exactly when it was built. We don't know for whom it was built. We don't know exactly by whom he was it was built, although we have a hunch it was by Brazilian returnees. Now, when you look at uh, what the books say about um, Ilojo Bar or Casa de Fernandes, it was built in very different years. It could have been built in 1846. That's the very earliest one. And these are Princeton dissertations. So these are really serious publications. Uh, it could have been built in 1850, 1855. The latest I have found is 1890. But where it comes from and where it is, um, what it's based on, it's often very hard to say. In those academic um, publications, it's often used as uh, an example, the earliest example of Brazilian architecture. Um, and it is in many um, of the um, uh, of the in. Sorry, somebody has raised his hand. Uh, is there somebody who wants to ask a question now? Because the questions are supposed to be in the chat and will be addressed uh, later, unless it's something I think very. Femke, urgent. it's your yeah? cursor. We're not seeing the full slide, so maybe if you put the cursor in one position. Um... They're having okay. dark spots on the... Okay, that's weird. Um, wait, is this better? Um, no, it was there before, so I don't think it's... Okay, yeah, it's better. Yeah? All right. Okay, Peju, you have to check everything now because I'm not seeing anything of the, of the rest better. of the screen. Yeah? All right. It's better. Um, where was I? Oh, yes. So the earliest example of Brazilian architecture in Lagos. That's what it's uh, put out to be in those Princeton dissertations. It was built for the Fernandez family, a family of returnees from Brazil. Um, there was a Pa Fernandez, one of the uh, oldest Brazilian returnees. And we also heard, and that was also in an academic publication, it was a punishment house for slaves. Again, no uh, proper uh, sourcing of any of these stories. Now, when I started researching Ilojo Bar, um, a place that I loved so much that I used to take my mother to go and see it if she would come on a visit to Lagos. When I started researching the history, I first came across the angel. You will all know it as the angel. You've all come across it on Tinubu Square, 
where it was on top of the building. Well, if you look well, you realize she has no wings. In fact, she was not an angel, but it's quite um, imaginable that people would have called her an angel because they've only seen her from afar and from down below. But when I started researching that, because the interesting thing is, the angel was the only thing, one of the few things that was saved during the demolition. Apparently, the demolisher was given instructions to save it. It was put in, uh, in blankets and was saved. And it was brought back to the National Museum uh, this year in January. And then I could also research it and try to uh, establish its provenance. Now, the statuette actually was called Primavera. And it came from all the way from Porto in Portugal. It came from a factory that opened in 1884. And it would have come as a series. There were uh, normally four seasons, and this was one of them. And it's quite possible that it came via Brazil. That is possible. But for sure, we know that the finishing of the house cannot date before this 1884. So that's already an important indication, which led me to believe that this dating of 1848, nah, probably not entirely correct. Now, then I went into the land registry. Now, when I say I went into the land registry, that sounds much easier than it seems because I had a lot of problems getting those documents from the land registry, even though they're public. I will spare you the details, but um, I had to, in the end, uh, find the help of a law firm and a good friend who helped me get some of them, fish some of them out of the archives. The interesting thing is with deeds that often in the sidelines, there are little pictures drawn of the exact plots that were sold or that the deed was about. And that was in those margins, that was where the, um, uh, the solution of the, the riddle of Casa de Fernandez was hidden in. It is really hard to see now, but let me just take you through it. So plot, uh, when you go to A in 1890, that is a plot that did not um, belong to anybody whose name we know until 1890. And then a little bit of the plot on the right-hand side um, was um, bought by somebody called Fernandez. But the entire plot, you see the measured drawing on the right, the entire plot was much bigger than that. So only a very small part of that plot was then bought by somebody by the name of Fernandez. In 1995, something else happened. It was bought by somebody else, did not have to do with Fernandez. 1897, the same thing. In fact, not until 1903 was the entire plot in the hands of a person called Fernandez. And uh, when, is, sorry, somebody is raising their hands again. If there's something really important that they have to say, go ahead. Otherwise, I will just continue. All right. So the important thing to realize is the measured drawing, as you see on the right, uh, which was done um, at the, um, the measurements by, by Legacy and by uh, the architects that wanted to do a renovation of Ilojo Bar in 2012. That's how we know Casa de Fernandez. That's how we know Ilojo Bar. And in 1903, you still see that yard just above C. But that yard actually is not a yard anymore in the measured drawing. So in 1903, this Fernandez character he, for the first time, had the entire plot in his hand. This was the first time that the plot that was Casa de Fernandez was built on and could be unified as a house. It's very possible that the right side of the house, if you stood in front of it on Tinubusquer, the right side of the house already was quite magnificent. But Ilojo Bar, as we know it, did not exist before 1903, which is quite an interesting finding. If you see that some academics even put the building date in, uh, the early, um, in 1848. Now, what the documents also told, and that to me was more shocking than anything, that the actual Fernandez was not a Brazilian returnee. He was a Galician from Spain. 
a merchant from Beagle. And uh, in the whole of its history, the building itself was never in Brazilian hands. At some point, I'm sure it was built by Brazilians and there are indications that uh, Cifre, one of the master painters who was also involved in uh, the painting of the cathedral was, was involved. He was actually a good friend of a business partner of the Fernandes, but the actual Fernandes that we all talk about when we say Casa do Fernandes had nothing to do with Brazil in the sense that he was not Brazilian. He was a Galician. At that time, Galicia was, um, uh, uh, was an impoverished area. It's just a bit north of Portugal, an impoverished area of Spain. Um, most Galicians were second-class citizens in their own country. So they were looking for greener pastures abroad. Sound familiar? And there were many migrants who came to Portugal in the first place, to Brazil later, and then eventually uh, also via Brazil uh, came to Lagos. Now, Mr. Fernandes came not on his own. He came with a friend. Um, with a friend called Rodriguez. And these Rodriguez were um, Portuguese he knew from Porto and who set up shop in Lagos, but also in Porto Novo and also in Brazil. So probably that was the connection and that is also the connection it has with Brazil. Now this does not in any way make it any less of Brazilian, Afro-Brazilian heritage. It just goes to show that the story that we've been telling has not been accurate. And I've come to realize that that might be part of the reason that we haven't been able to communicate the importance of it enough uh, for people that it really mattered. Now, apart from the story of Casa do Fernandes, the history of Casa do Fernandes, it's also the history, the making of a monument, because it was not Brazilians who decided Casa do Fernandes, Ilojo Bar was a monument. It was not the Olaya family. It was not Nigerians. It were two British enthusiasts for heritage who in the 50s admired this building so much that they said, this is the most important architectural building in Lagos. This should be preserved. And those two were Murray and Fag. They were both uh, would become uh, directors of the Antiquities Department, which is the forerunner of the NCMM, the National Museum, for, uh, the National Commissions for Museums and Monuments. And they have decided this is a monument. Now, it was not like the Olayas had much to say over it. It just, they were just told, okay, you are now in a monument. And um, unfortunately, neither Murray nor Fag did a lot of research into the story of the building, because if they had, and even at that time, there would still have been oral sources who knew um, who knew who Fernandez was, uh, Jose Amuedo Fernandez, or who knew his uh, the, the the man who bought the place from him next who was a business partner of his, also from Galicia, uh, Napoleon Recoutu. Recoutu was a very well-known person in Lagos. Fernandez was not. He did not spend more than 20 years in Lagos. And when he left, he spent another 35 in Galicia and he never set foot here again. So we are talking about this Fernandez uh, heritage when in fact the Olaya family has lived there for much, much, much longer. So why is it not the Olaya house? Why has it become Ilojo bars? Of course, because people went there to, uh, to hang out and to listen to music, etc. But it just goes to show that the narrative from the first uh, moment on was not inclusive and did not take the public and the owners along. In fact, I've seen some communications with the Olaya family that made me uh, made me even feel bad for them. They wanted to um, renovate the back part of the building, which is not uh, seen as very architecturally interesting, although I think it's historically very interesting, but they wanted to renovate the back side of the building and the NCMM said, okay, but then you have to vacate the front, just like that. As if 
if it, so, so they had been deprived in a way, and I'm sure that must have been what it felt like sometimes, of, uh, of their, their ownership. Um, and the moments, um, oh yes, I forgot to tell that Murray in fact liked the building so much that they wanted to make a national museum out of it that would be celebrating independence. But unfortunately, the amount that was offered to the Olayas to buy out their property was so low that even uh, in, in the early 1900s, it wouldn't have been uh, realistic. So in that sense, I have gotten to understand better how the Olayas did not feel like they were heard or that, that had any role to play in this thing that we have all been calling important heritage. Now, what does this mean for the heritage when it comes to a lojo bar? It means, of course, that the issue is much broader than Brazilian heritage, but it doesn't exclude that either. It's also Afro-Brazilian heritage. The connection is also to the people is also different than we've always assumed. And there are many more connections to be made. And um, I would advocate when we're reviewing an issue of heritage to also think who feels connected to this story, but who feels excluded as well. Because you, if you tell a story about your childhood or about something that doesn't involve somebody else and you keep poking on that one and that's the sole narrative, then you will exclude everybody who wasn't there. So there are more stories to tell and different stories. And also we should check if our own biases play a role because I really wonder why um, the role of Ilojo Bar, for example, as a place where there were concerts, where the new juju was being <coughs> developed. Sorry. Why that wasn't <coughs> also a very important piece of this heritage of uh, Ilojo Bar. So I would like to advocate that Ilojo Bar, Casa de Fernandez, Olaya House is not just a story about uh, the Brazilian heritage. It is very much so, but it's also the place where Allende Bacare performed night after night in the 50s. It's also the place where King Sonia Ade got his first guitar at Victor Olaya's music shop. It's the place probably where Herbert Macaulay in the 1910s ran a restaurant from. I found some evidence of that in the Herbert Macaulay papers. Still have to look into that. But imagine if that were the case, and that was the early days of Nigerian nationalism, how many interesting uh, political discussions were, uh, would have taken place there. It's also the place where the uh, traditional ruler of Abeokuta spent a couple of nights on an official visit to Lagos in the early 1900s. These things are much more connecting and they tell a much broader story than simply saying this is Brazilian heritage and it might not only even partly be true. So that's why um, over my research, I come to realize that we have to know the story first and we have to do research and that costs time and that costs money, but it's important to do before we start shouting from the rooftop, this is important heritage. Then we have to check our biases because why is the juju music link not just as important as the Brazilian one? And why is it not just as important as a family house to the Olayas, where generation after generation has lived? So we have to also value what other people value and the people around it and the people using it and the people who own it value and look for more inclusive stories while listening to the owners and the users and the public. And last of all, we have to think of new ways to tell the story because another museum is not going to work. Who goes to a museum? But why not make it a concert hall? Or why not make it um, a palm wine bar? There was a lot of palm wine, uh, very nice palm wine served in the 50s in Ilojo Bar. Elderly Lagosians, uh, let me know. So only if we do all that, I think, then we can tell the story of Ilojo Bar, Olaya House, Casa de Fernandez. And these things do not only apply, of course, to this particular monument that is no more, 
see a client, and that's why um, uh, what we're going to discuss now. These the question is in how much they apply to other pieces of heritage, and that's I think where I will stop sharing. Okay. Amazing. Thank you so much, Femke. You're I welcome. The research that you've done was quite extensive and interesting. Um, now we're going to have panel discussions on these findings. It's, it's amazing to think that the narrative about Afro-Brazilian and <laughs> Brazil. Um, you do make a comment. Someone's even commenting that it's fascinating research and you make a compelling argument. Well Thank done. you. Yes, so Femke, I think over to you and yes. our panelists. Let's go for a first round. Uh, just a quick reaction to the panelists. Professor Osasona, your first ideas, your first response. You have to unmute. Sorry, yeah. just uh, before I make any comment, let me salute you, Femke, like everybody else is doing. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Very, very interesting research, thoroughly, you know, well articulated, painstakingly pursued. I want to say that I had the singular privilege of reading your thesis, and uh, I'm glad that you are now actually putting voice to what I read on paper. One thing that, you know, struck me, even when I was reading, I'm also that you have run through your presentation is that it is extremely important to settle the issue of whose heritage, whose heritage, who precisely owns the heritage you're talking about. Because until that issue is resolved, you may end up making suggestions, making policies that at the end of the day, only a you to dance round and round in circles. And the other thing that I saw work, um, you know, the order, the hierarchy of any proposed intervention. Hitherto, we've had a top to bottom kind of thing, and it has just not worked. It has not gelled because fundamentally, we have not been able to get the people who understand they have heritage, who in the long run will be the ones to run with a vision. If we don't start tackling this issue from a bottom up kind of an orientation, I don't think we'll get far. Of course, we need the top, we need the policies, we need the government, we need all that. But if the people themselves don't buy into what heritage symbolizes, I shared an experience with uh, FMK a while back. There was a time I was driving and I, you know, prof, I saw the... Prof, before, before you go into, let's just do the quick round first okay. and then yeah. we'll, yeah? yeah. Thank you so yeah. much, yeah. Professor. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Mrs. Ravello Costa, can you, um, because you said Brazil used to do the top-down approach, uh, but these days you do it differently. Can you, uh, with my research in mind, explain uh, briefly how that's done. Um, well, of, of course, we, as you said, we had to do beforehand a lot of uh, house uh, homework. We had to do a lot of research first. So we have to get to know exactly what are the attributes and what are the values of the built heritage as, as it was listed, as it was, even if it was like top down. So we have, in order to communicate and in order to, to be able to talk uh, to the residents, we have to know as an institution what we understand as the thing is valuable. Uh, so not, we don't like uh, want to preserve everything as it was like, uh, like uh, in Brazil we say, well, we're gonna freeze the, 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 the monument, but we have to know exactly what is important um, from the history, what we want to pass along to other generations, what is the most important thing we, we know from that building or that uh, city, 
that we want to preserve because we have to acknowledge that things change, things have to adapt uh, for the modern life or, I mean, uh, we now have bathrooms in the 1800s we didn't have. It. So we have to adapt to the dynamics of the new, new, new times, but we still have to uh, understand what is the, the most important. So um, in order to do that and to communicate, so we have to, to acknowledge that. And, and then when we pass to this new phase of uh, trying to gather information from the residents, uh, what they understand about it, what they, what they see as a heritage and what they want, what they want in the future from that. So uh, if, it, if, it's, uh, if it's abandoned building, do they need a school? Do they need a museum? what the community needs are, so we can try to combine all the things all together. So we have in one side, we have the values that it's, it's important. And one way, in the other hand, we have the, the community needs. So That's very clear. Thank you yeah. so much. I wanted to continue to Dr. Uguanyi. Um, okay. In this respect about asking the people involved, right? What it means and what they want with it. That must sound interesting to you. Yes, uh, well, I, I think I will look at this from another perspective. Uh, something that has to do with uh, people's uh, mental makeup. How, how do you perceive things from your own cultural background? How do you perceive things from your own uh, uh, cognition? So if you look at the way uh, most Nigerians react to heritage, especially when they are, then uh, you'll find out that it's difficult to convince people to be part of what they, they, they don't believe in. There are uh, levels of connection to heritage, and we usually uh, refer to these terms like attachment. So who is attached to what heritage and who has something that connects him or her to a particular heritage. And until you identify those who are attached, who have some kinds of attachment to a particular heritage, then it will be difficult to, to consult. And again, uh, when you find people who are attached and connected, to what extent can that translate to national? Because uh, this argument is about national monuments, national heritage, and whose heritage is it? I will use a term that is common amongst the Igbo. And uh, this uh, uh, term, I'll say it in Igbo and translate as much as I can in English. So uh, the Igbo of my part will say, Ewo hana onegu. This simply means that uh, uh, goat belonging to the public would die of hunger. And uh, what it means is that what uh, we own in collective and which we don't have attachment to, we don't care for them. So uh, yes, of course, it is good to always talk about national, but it's difficult to maintain that in a multicultural uh, nation like Nigeria. So what I have always suggested is for national museums to uh, serve as a, um, a kind of uh, libraries or kind of uh, depositories for uh, 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 giving little backgrounds to cultural heritage that are in the villages. So if someone visits museums and look through them and feels he or she wants to know more, then you visit the village or the community where these thank things are located. So, so, so for a much you. more local approach to heritage, I'm yes. wondering what Mrs. Tofa Bashir thinks of that. Um, Mrs. Tofa Bashir, you uh, renovated um, a local Hausa school. Um, yes. do, you, do you see something in uh, doc, um, in, in the, the doctor's approach? <clears throat> um, well, I agree with both <laughs> um, the two speakers that, that are coming before me. One, I feel like it's important to also have a sort of, um, in the Princess Foundation, we used to call it um, design by inquiry, where you get all the stakeholders and it design always has to start with a series of meetings where you actually where it's inclusive and you, um, you invite all the stakeholders, including community members and ultimately people who will be using the building. Um, and this should always um, influence what the building and the design will become. Um, so in that sense, I do agree. And I also agree <laughs> that um, sometimes 
um, after that, for me, when, when you started talking about it, um, I actually envisioned this would, I, I, I asked myself, well, why can't this be um, a HQ for the national commissions? If you're saying um, this is the most important building in Lagos in terms of heritage, um, I know this is a subjective view, um, but I think I, I heard something like that when you were speaking. Um, then why shouldn't it be a headquarters for the national commissions where at the same time it's a museum that people are coming into and that also helps the community to preserve um, the building and also the, all the ideas that you presented that are behind the building? Interesting question. Thank you so much, Mr. Stoffer Bashir. Um, I, I, my remark about the museums was set in the, um, uh, well, I've been to the National Museum recently and there are school children who go there, but who of us or which Nigerians go there on a regular basis? It's a, um, very much a British idea of how to present your heritage. And um, the question is, should we, and I say we, and then should take a step back, not decolonize, decolonize those ideas of heritage. Dr. Uwai, mm. what, what do you think? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, uh, if you look at what I've just explained, uh, my thinking is that uh, museum approach should be decolonized. Okay, let me look at this from another perspective, what I call the utilitarian value of heritage. And uh, for architecture, architectural scholars, they would call it uh, adaptive reuse to an extent. So uh, in this uh, context, people are interested in what is useful. I was just reading somebody talking about how does this pay my children's school fees? And that's, that is the kind of question. If we, the things we keep in the museum, how does it help the, the level of poverty? But let's make a shift from that a bit. Can I, I just say something I, before you move forward? I, I don't mean, think museum okay. has to be like in the center. That. Sorry, I didn't sorry, get you right. You, you, your connection dropped a bit, uh, Rukai. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I said um, the idea of a museum doesn't. Oh. Oh dear. Sorry. Sorry. Include many other. Oh. Yeah, I think. Is it my network? Some... Yes, yeah. my network is, yeah. is wonky. Sorry about that. Just continue, so, please. <laughs> okay. Sorry to cut okay, you off. So, well, um, Dr. Oguayi, before you continue, yeah. I would like to give uh, Professor Osasuna also the possibility to respond to what you said about um, uh, making heritage also usable. Because I'm, I have a feeling that that's what she's been doing, right, Professor? Yes, thank you. I was very glad when uh, Dr. Oguayi mentioned adaptive reuse because honestly this is what i'm doing heritage is useful but it shouldn't be conceptualized as heritage frozen only for viewing there's nothing that says heritage cannot be lived in because that's where you exactly. get the best of two worlds exactly heritage the heritage value is preserved but then it is also serving utilitarian purposes either to the owners or to the general public in one way or the other so nothing yeah. says that's the point I wanted have... to make. Exactly. So you can't eat your cake and have it in that context. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be mm -hmm. a museum, you know, time yes. bound, frozen for just overviewing. Mm -hmm. It can be lived in, yes. serving, you know, contemporary uses. So both ways you yes. gain. It's a win-win situation. Is that also your I completely experience? agree. And that's the point that I okay. wanted to make. Ah, great. And your connection is back. Good to see that. <laughs> okay. This is Rabello Costa. Is that also your experience? Um, I mean, uh, Brazilian uh, governments okay. are more conservative towards that adaptive reuse. So normally all the listed uh, monuments and sites will eventually become museums or like governmental buildings. Um, 
but uh, now I, I'm, I'm doing my master's in the Netherlands and they're a pro in adaptive reuse. And I heard from a teacher here that uh, sustainability is, uh, it has, we have to get heritage in a sustainability approach because the most sustainable building is the one that it already exists. So, so we have to think about uh, of the already existing buildings and try to adapt it because this is the most sustainable way to, to uh, I mean, to for like saving um, materials and constructions and time. So uh, it's another approach to see heritage here. And I think it's very inspiring. Of course, we don't have to follow the Brazilian way. We can even make it more revolutionary, <laughs> Abby. <laughs> Now, Professor Osasuna, what's the way forward? Because um, Olaya well, House is no longer, but we can learn from this. Maybe one of the things, uh, it had happened differently and there had been a better use for it, uh, there wouldn't have been a demolition, you never know. But what's the way forward? Well, there's no way we're going to talk about this thing in all sincerity and we don't talk to the government. Because it's one thing to have policies on paper, it's another thing for you to have genuine political will to make them succeed. So there's a lot that needs to come from the government in terms of putting bite to policies and things. That's one aspect. But one thing that I also find will forever be creating a schism, is even if at the top things are done right and you have not succeeded in carrying the grassroots along in terms of sensitization, I think everything actually should start if we want something enduring with the people themselves. The people need to be sensitized as to what heritage is all about. It need not be anything high polluting. Dr. Oguanyi told us about his childhood memories of the village square, no buildings there, usually just trees, you know, and that kind of thing. But the sense of community, you know, cultural relevance, community worth, all that kind of thing. So we really have to start at the bottom, get people to understand this thing about heritage, get people to own their cultural artifacts, their cultural values. And then it shouldn't be too difficult when something is going all right with something and you're saying, okay, let's intervene to put this. You will get people doing it with every goodwill in the world because it's something already stamped in their hearts. So they're, they're ready to do anything that needs to be done. So I think Thank you, we cannot get it right without starting at the bottom. Dr. Uguayi, people should start or re-own their cultural values. What's your response to that? Is that one out of your, straight from your heart? Yeah. Um, oh dear, I think now your connection is a bit wonky. Uh, I think, uh, oh. um, yes. Well, uh, can you hear me now? Um, yes. yes, we can. Uh, people reowning their heritage, I think is one of, one of it, but I think there are more to that. And uh, this particular dimension is the idea that many a times we scholars or we professionals uh, think that people in the villages, people in the local communities are not connected. I think what happens is that we disconnect them. Uh, there is what I call historical hyping, which is one of the things you reported about the Ilojoba where uh, people decided to say that this is what Ilojoba is, and that became uh, the national narrative, uh, the, uh, uh, alienating Ilojoba from every other narrative. And uh, uh, until we, we return to understand that there are many dimensions to narrative about one particular heritage, then we cannot get it right. So even if we want to say people should be on their heritage, the, the question is, how do we know that they have not replaced this heritage in their cultural places? So if, if we, for instance, say people should take, okay, take over what is a national museum and the owners should control them, 
how are we sure that the, from the places from where those things were collected, they are not already replaced within the cultural realm? I think uh, we should look uh, uh, more at how heritage is a cultural process and uh, how heritage live in communities, how heritage live with people. I've argued about this in several fora, that heritage has a life. And uh, in many other, uh, I think there are many other views from many other parts of the world that heritage has a life. If it is in an, in an inanimate heritage, it has a life. That life is the narrative. That life is the value. That life is the attachment with which it live, with which people uh, uh, value them. Once that life is taken away, then uh, to many people here, in the way we, we, the way we, we think, the way our cognition is set around heritage, it becomes irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And until we understand how heritage live and how we can make it relieve in communities where they belong, then we can we cannot get it right. So I think this is what we should think about. So it's more deep Thank than so just much. saying government should do this, do that. Thank you. True. Mrs. Rabelo Costa, heritage um, has a lifespan or has a life cycle, and maybe it cannot be revived. Or if it can be, we should understand how to revive it. What what? How do you respond to that? Do you recognize anything of that? Oh wow, uh, that was deep. Um, I think it has a cycle, but I don't think it has an end. I think that the dynamics of uh, of people and life and cities they bring like different needs and different ways of seeing heritage. But I think that's the the importance of trying to keep track of history itself. I mean, like not only in heritage, like history itself, because things change, but some things have to remain as 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 the, 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 the a meaning, like an uh, initial meaning. And that's, I, I think that's why you have so many difficulties in Lojobar in tracing back the history uh, of the initial uh, thing of the house because nobody cared to tell the story at the beginning. So if if we don't keep have this, this initial cycle of trying to get things as important, I mean, how can you how can you see the future of it anyways? So it's, it's important to see how, how the, the, the building, uh, why was it built? Uh, Sorry, what Mrs. Is it Adedeji, for? could you off your microphone? Sorry. Mrs. Adedeji, could you off your microphone, please? I cannot do it from here. And... Okay. Well, it's... I hear Brazilian, I hear Portuguese. I don't know if I think it's, it's coming it from, from Carla. Oh, okay. sorry. Okay. I thought it was someone else. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Carla, you can go ahead. Okay. Your microphone's muted now. Sorry, sorry. I had people running out in the house here. Sorry about that. Um, but uh, yes, I, I think that's that's the the biggest importance of of keeping the heritage. Uh, I mean, alive. The documenting is so important because of that. Even though it changes the use over time, I think I think the the, the meaning of the thing, the initial meaning, it, it serves for a purpose. Thank you, Carla. Now to Mrs. Tofa Bashir, the last one. Uh, the meaning changes, but the use can still happen. I think your school is an example of that, isn't it? Can you unmute yourself? Hello, yeah. can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Um, could you ask the question again, please? Yes, so the meaning of heritage or the use of heritage may change over its life cycle, but that doesn't mean that the value of it uh, disappears. I think your school is an example of that, isn't it? Yes, yes. And um, I don't want to keep um, going back to sustainability. For me, that's really what it's about. Um, I think for legacy, of... it's also what it's about. <laughs> Good. <laughs> 
so yes, the, 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 the meaning can change, but the use the use can change, but the meaning ultimately should still, you know, all the memories it invokes um, in terms of history um, is something that is um, carried through the ages, I feel. And of course, um, for me, a big issue with that is um, mater- in terms of building is the materiality and, um, you know, or the memories and, and um, structural quality, the... Um, the um, kind of aesthetic um, look and feel of the space. So all that is carried through. And yes, it's, the history is very important. Um, it's, it's very important in terms of carrying more meaning, putting more meaning into the, into the buildings, definitely. Thank you. Um, Thank it's you something so that has to translate to the younger ones. Thank you so much. Meaning, uh, narrative, um, carrying the audience along, asking the people first. I think these are the main ideas that come out of this panel. Now we're overarching a bit. Uh, I think I want to uh, do a five uh, minute Q&A. What do you think, Peju? Can we still stretch it up to that? I think we can still stretch it to a bit. All five right, minutes. okay. Good. So um, because there are so many people, kindly put your questions in the chat. Uh, and also to whom they're for, and we'll do a short selection of them. Uh, I've been reading very interesting feedback also from a member of the Olaya family who indicated that yes, they did not feel heard, and it is an Olaya family house. Um, and, and that's part of the narrative, of course, that was sort of disappeared over the years. Now, if anybody has any, um, Oh, thank you, Mrs. Adelike. I was about to do that. Has any interest in becoming a member of uh, Legacy, uh, you can send an email to uh, the uh, email that's uh, written in the chat. Um, I don't know if you are now all frantically typing questions or if your questions have been answered. There was a lot of feedback about... Um, well, there was a short question or okay. well, it's all right, it looks like a question, but then it came ended up as a comment from Adjo Kupe. And okay. um, she said that um, for her, there are some key concerns in terms of area with, with heritage buildings that are grappling with other developmental challenges, basic needs. Um, the issue is that when we speak about heritage, it is usually esoteric and disconnected from the day to day. The question she's asked, I believe Adam is into tourism. I don't know if she has a question to ask. How will this help me feed my family, pay my children, school fees, etc.? Which I think is usually the challenge when um, you say something is a monument that belongs to a family. So they're beginning to wonder how they're going to deal with that. I don't know if um, Professor Sashonor wants to address that. This might be why even the owners of the heritage struggle to deal with it or to accept it and preserve it. And Carla would also like Carla, to. Okay, Carla yeah, is willing. Okay, thank but you, let Prof also. Okay, I can't, you, I can't comment on that. Uh, I mean, of course, we, we not only have like monumental and big buildings as a monument, we also have like regular houses from people that are important for uh, Brazilian history. But we have like a strong le- uh, heritage legislation that uh, assures that when a person does not have the means to preserve or conserve the house, she can, she or he can go to the to Heritage Institute, which is where I work, and uh, plea for help. So I mean, you have to prove that you don't have the means to conserve. So the government has the the. the has the duty of step in and try to conserve for these people because, because the interest is a public interest. It's not like a private in, interest on this particular family, but it, uh, conserving this building is, is important for the whole nation. So, so we guarantee uh, on our legislation that uh, the conservation it has to be carried out by the government in the case that uh, the, the person doesn't have the means to. Up um, government engagement. Um, Professor Shashunov, do you yes. want to add to this? 
Yes, I, I do want to add to it because um, my approach is it isn't every one of these interventions that has government input. I mean, sometimes these things can be undertaken by NGOs and there should be a kind of partnership arrangement whereby putting the house in good living order, you can still have members of the family using the place and then open up either a part of it or for a part of the day or a part of, you know, seasonally, some parts of the building to the public. And of course that is done for a token. People pay for overviewing such heritage, you know, such monuments. So whatever income comes based on an agreement between the house owners and the body, the NGO, the whatever, that you know, expended energy, money, got the expertise to put that structure in tip top condition, there will always be something coming to the family. And then I actually laughed at the beginning of the comment about uh, how does, you know, there, there are more important, that's life. We always have to prioritize. There will forever be, you know, things you deem more important engaging your attention, you know, that you think, you know, they, those things deserve your attention, they deserve your finances better than, you know, plowing money into a dilapidated building, blah, blah, blah. But like we said, there's no way you're talking about heritage, you're not talking about sentiments. There's no way. So if it's something you really, really value for whatever reasons, yes, you may not actually have the wherewithal, but if you do get an NGO, or maybe, I don't know, if you do get someone who is prepared to plow money based on the people owning the house, bringing their own percentage contribution, things can be worked out whereby the family gets something at the end of the day. So something should still come to a stakeholder. Dr. Uguanyi, you raised you raise your hand. Yes, I would like to particularly respond to the question about uh, how does that pay my children's school fees? And uh, that takes us to a very complex and political nature of heritage. And also that we tell you that uh, there are skills as levels of attachment to heritage. It's not all about money, and, uh, you know, for the nation, they think it's about identity and probably truth is isn't money. And for the people who feel very privileged and have that pride that my heritage is preserved, that to them is more important than uh, the money they are going to generate. So it's not necessarily about money all the time, because even when you say people pay, in the, in the NCMM Act, there, are place, there is a section that's talked about uh, paying to owners to be able to take over monument. But the question is, how much is that? Is it, is it, is it going to be able to pay someone's school fees? Yes, look at because what I spent? want to, sorry to interject, okay. but I want to say the moment that NCMM or the Department of Antiquities offered money to the Olayas, it was a tuppence. There was never enough to That's really uh, be an honest pay for such kind of property in such prime location. So it is about pride in what you have. I think more of pride and, and privilege to send a private property to become a public property and represent a collective narrative. And that for many people is what is heritage and not necessarily national or whatever, but that pride and attachment. Seju, I think you should choose one more question to answer and then we should start rounding up because I don't want people dropping off because they have other engagements. Well, um, I'll just take two. Um, one is actually for you. Um, the question is from Hodo says, what was the most unexpected part of your research? Oh, and what's the, the most forward with this research? Yeah. The worst unexpected was the fact that it was not ever in Brazilian hands because I loved that history about people who were once abducted from their homelands, uh, brought to Brazil um, into slavery, but who had returned and who had become so um, skilled and valuable people in, in, in Lagos that they changed the, the, the side of Lagos. And all of a sudden, it turned out to be a Spaniard. It was a European like me. 
which was also a bit confrontational because I thought, well, was that maybe why I liked the building so much? Because it looked like the palaces that I saw in my youth in Southern Europe when I went on holiday. So that was, for me, <laughs> the most confronting finding. The way forward is um, this. The way forward is uh, that um, I'm also going to make uh, an exhibition about a more uh, inclusive history, more stories about Ilojo Bar, Olaya House, Cata de Fernandez. Um, but it's also about these kind of webinars where we not focus only on what the government does or does not do or won't do, but also see that uh, people are already doing things. That's why I brought these panelists here together, because many of them are already doing something despite of government. And that's something that I really, really would like uh, to, to encourage. Thank you so much for that question, Lodun. Um, there's one more question and somebody has been raising up um, his or her hand. So we'll, I think we can let the person speak before I ask the final question. Um, Ajahn, do you want to say something? Yes, right. Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for the session. It's a very quick question. I like the attempts to answer my question. I come as a tourism researcher and I do a lot of feasibility studies and master plans and looking at how we can also create sustainable tourism. And the question that I, I was trying to ask, right, was more along the lines of when you speak to, so there's a project I had in Ogun State, for example, that it was the conflict between the you know, the, the, the residents and what was supposedly a heritage, et cetera. And is this sense of how do we, what is the inc more inclusive value proposition? Because even when we talk about people paying to come and view this as a way of earning money, right? It's still a bit, what's the word? It still assumes that people want to come and view heritage in a building is my point, right? And so I don't know if you can answer that here. It would be nice if anyone can answer it later on or point me to others that have tried to, or is that sense of how, particularly in Lagos now, right? We're saying, how do we create better sense of inclusive tourism that retains the heritage buildings in a way that also identifies that many of these communities don't see the importance of, of the heritage buildings, right? And even if we say, okay, how do we communicate it to them beyond a sense of, yes, you can make economic you can have economic value from this, but also, yeah, like that this is good for your, you know, for the future generations. Because the question I'm then asked is, well, my children need to eat today, ETC. And then I look back and think, oh goodness, okay, that's true. And then I don't know what else to say. All right, thank you. Does anybody want to attempt to answer that? Sorry. <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah, at the risk of sounding like yeah. a, a broken record, I think everything still comes back to educating the people. It's not something that can be done overnight, but it's something those of us who are passionate about conservation of heritage need to get, you know, roll up our sleeves and get into. At whichever level we can communicate what heritage is all about and the importance of preserving it, then we should get going and do it. I do it with my students, even in other courses that are not mainstream conservation and restoration courses. And, you know, even talking with people in the market, buying things, occasionally I harp to these issues. There will be proper programs drawn up, grassroots sensitization seminars, you know, go, I don't know how else we want to do it. Those ones will be there, but they have, there has to be, you know, a more subtle, person to person, a general changing of the psyche. It's not going to happen overnight. But the important thing is that those of us who are passionate about it will constitute the core and will generate a ripple effect. If I'm generating a ripple effect here in Ife, I mean, um, the Rukaya is doing it in Kano, all over the place like that. And of course, if we do have a sensitive government, like someone said much earlier, they will be doing it from the top. So it's a two-pronged attack. So that eventually two-pronged approach, I mean, it's better that way. So that eventually this is something that even subconsciously people become more and more aware of than we are today. Oh dear. Network. <laughs> Prof, your network is leaving you and us. Wow. 
Um, yeah. Oh, so that's bad. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, Professor um, Uguayi, and then we give the floor, I would suggest so good, to Mr. Olaya, who, that's my who has been keeping his hand up and has been giving lots of feedback. But first, Professor, uh, sorry, Dr. Uguayi, and then to you, the last words, Mr. Olaya. Okay. Um, so yeah. Not too long, please, because of our Okay, time. okay, yeah. okay. So uh, I think uh, I would like to respond to Arjun. I think I pronounced rightly. Sorry if I didn't. So um, this is a question about tourism development. And uh, we have uh, an aspect of tourism we call heritage tourism. And uh, I would also like to explain something about the uh, multifaceted implication, economic implication of tourism. So if a heritage, for instance, is turned to uh, a pool factor for tourism, and that, that the, the kind of economic generates can help you take care of your problem. Just let, leave out what NCMM will give to you. Let's look at the kind of business that, can, that such tourism can trigger around such vicinity. And that is, that is the dimension we look at heritage when we talk about heritage tourism. Then, uh, well, because of time, uh, I will say, well, we can take it up after here. So let's get in touch and I'll give you more details about heritage and tourism interface. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Wanyi. Now there is a member of the Olaya family among us. I invited more, but I don't know if they are here. You are given the floor, but just very, very shortly, sir. Can you unmute? Ah, yes. Oh, unfortunately, we can't hear we you. can't hear you, Mr. Olaya. Mr. Olaya? Any, oops, oh, yes. can you hear me now? Yes, yes. please. Yes, I can't can. hear you. Anyway, I'll, I'll talk briefly and then I'll just, yeah, plug it back in and stuff. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure not to be here. I've learned a few new things. Um, I'd heard of it being Portuguese and Brazilian. Now I hear it's Spanish. Um, it's very well, sad it's what Nigerian. happened. I'm living Nigerian. in the UK when we heard about that. It's it was Nigerian, first absolutely of all. <laughs> devastating. Um, I'm glad to see Legacy here um, working with the family and hopefully with the government in the end to restore some semblance of what was there before. Um, I would, however, in my last shot, call for inclusion. Um, yep, nice word inclusion, nice word sustainable. Um, uh, including the family uh, and the community uh, at large as well in this process. And I'll leave it at that. So, yeah, I look forward to meeting with you all again. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Olaya. Well spoken. I think we can round it up there. Um, thank you so much, everybody. I'm going to give Peju the... Um, oh, no. Um, Mrs. Adelike was going to round up, Ooh, right? Yes. Yeah. I just want to, uh, to add that um, the reason I uh, gathered all these people that I gathered was also because they are already doing things and they didn't know each other or just partly. And I just hope that this will also be the start uh, and the continuation of a network and a network of legacy. So again, if you're interested in heritage, interested in these kind of issues, please... Uh, join Legacies and send us an email. Thank you so much. I'll be putting up the email address to which you can send an email for membership with Legacy. Um, meanwhile, let me have Mrs. Adelike, our president, to give the closing remarks. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I will try to be as brief as I can, but honestly, I have so many things to say because this was really very, very rich. I mean, first of all, I would just like to start off by saying that whether the building was built by a Spaniard or a Brazilian, the fact remains that it was built in Lagos and there were skilled Nigerian artisans who worked on that building. And that is very, very important to remember. I mean, I think this story of Ilojaba continues. There's much, much more that we can try to do the research. I mean, I think Femcare has been a wonderful job in uncovering lots of new information, but I think, you know, the search continues, the story continues. Um, I would like to also to say that the video was great. I mean, it was very, very moving. You know, it was very, very traumatic because I remember going down to the site trying to search through the rubble for some fragments of the ironwork, which I couldn't find. 
um, to um, Professor Cordelia. I really enjoyed a lot of what she was saying. Um, you have brought out some great books and I would just wonder whether it's possible for you to bring out a step-by-step -step guide on some of those field practice activities that you did, because this would be very helpful. They're very simple, very basic, but I think that simple guidelines like that are some of the things that we in Legacy have been trying to put together. So I think that could be an area that we could actually um, draw on. And just as Femke said, you know, we, we she sort of identified some new people who didn't know each other. We really do need to have a database of stakeholders working on built heritage matters. Um, so also very important, the owners of heritage buildings have been neglected. We have to look at how they're being treated. Um, in 2018, we did bring together, I think, about seven or eight families who own heritage buildings in Lagos and um, for a, a discussion about their issues so they could actually talk to government about these things. But definitely more needs to be done there. And urban and regional planning laws. Um, I think I know that we have some people here who, who are sort of experts in that area. And it does seem that many of our issues in Nigeria today lead back to urban and regional planning laws, including heritage matters. And so this is something, again, that we can take from this very important. Decolonizing museums, an important topic. Um, what we need more discussions about that, you know, whether it's adaptive free use, you know, how we sort of use, this, use these spaces to actually make them more African rather than having to just sort of bring out, bring models from Europe, which don't really fit into our own environment. And when it comes to the legal instruments, because I know that that was something that people uh, mentioned quite a bit, it is true that the NCMMM, that they have been updating these legal instruments. But the thing is, the approval is so slow, it's taking for years. So what do we do? I mean, what can we do to sort of maybe help the NCM to put more pressure on government to actually move with these new uh, with the new legislation that they're proposing. I mean, that is the issue. It's not the fact that the NCM don't want to change things, it's that they're having a, a, some kind of uh, a blockage with the government. Um, so I, I think all in all, I'm also very happy that um, we had people, we had, we had um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten her name from the North. Um, I've forgotten her name. Bashir. Yes, Bashir. yes. And also, um, Dr. Dr. from the East, because sometimes we do come over a bit Lagos centric. And so it's so great to actually see that all these things are happening. And it's so amazing that we have people who are quietly doing little projects in different parts of the country. And if there's any way that Legacy can help you to publicize what you're doing, to give voice to these sort of initiatives, because we have a newsletter and we do sort of try to to, to let people know, because that can also spark interest and actually bring in help. And, you know, it, it is quite, so sometimes we feel that we're the only ones doing things and nobody's interested, but definitely there are people in all corners of Nigeria who are quietly trying to, to get things done. And so if there's anything that we can do to sort of, um, you know, give more um, publicity to what you're doing, please do get in touch. So I would just like to say thank you to everybody here who spent the time and stayed with us throughout. Um, I know we had, we had somebody from the National Trust in the UK who was actually with us. And um, I, so I, I think that this is sort of going to go um, all over very fast. So well done to everybody. Thank you so much. All right, thank you everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. And Thank you um, so much. I really much. appreciate you. The video will be available on YouTube. Um, Legacy has a YouTube page. So be on the lookout. You can share it with your friends or people that you believe would have found this conversation interesting. Until next time, from us at Legacy, thank you so much and bye bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Everybody, bye. everybody bye. can unmute. <laughs> bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, bye. Bye. Thank you very much. <laughs> very stimulating. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you for coming. Bye. It's lovely to see bye. everybody. Bye. Thank you. That's great. Bye. Fabulous. Bye. Wonderful. Bye. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very Bye. much. Thank Bye. you. Thank Lovely you. to see you. Lovely to see you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Lord. Yes. Uh, well, thank you as well for all the help that you've been doing in terms of our cooperation together with the NCMM. Thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. We appreciate yes. it. Yeah, Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Well done, Femke. Do you want to stop? Yes.